Father God, I thank you, Lord God, for your love, your grace, your holiness, and your mercy today. I thank you for your promises today, Lord God. You are King of all kings and Lord of all lords. You are Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending. You are the first, the last, which is, which was, and which is to come. You are all and in all and through all and above all and in us all. And we thank you for your mercy. We thank you. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your promises to us. I pray today, Lord God, that you will continue to give us wisdom. Those of us that serve you, those of us that are seeking your face, those of us that are calling out on your name, Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will give us mercy and grace that you will hear, even Lord God, hallelujah, as King Solomon said, when he said, Lord God, that when your people have stumbled, when they have fallen, when they have backslidden, and when they have come to their senses, Lord God, and begun to repent and begun to call out to you, that God, in that moment, that you will hear, their voice from heaven, Lord God. You will hear their voice and you will hear and heal and deliver their land in Jesus' name. We thank you for that today. We pray, God, that you will overshadow this country, even in this country, Lord God, even in America, that you will overshadow us, Lord God, heal us and set us free in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen, and amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. What a glorious, glorious day it is in the Lord today. Oh, hallelujah, Lord God. Today's lesson is entitled, Hell, It's for a Lifetime. Amen? Hell, It's for a Lifetime. Now, you might think, well, I don't want to go to hell. Well, I don't either. But if you should so choose to go to hell, if you should so choose, hallelujah, to go in the wrong direction, well, God wants you to know that that is an eternal choice. And I pray today, I pray today that each and every one of us will make the wise choice. Oh, hallelujah today. There is, I'm reading right now from Luke 418. What, what I'm really reading is I'm reading the scripture from Isaiah chapter 61 in verse, probably verse 1 and 2. And, but I'm reading it as Jesus himself quoted it in Luke 418. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, 
to set at liberty those who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And Jesus paused at that moment. <laughs> he paused at that moment and he closed the scroll. He rolled the scroll up and he handed it back to the, the person that had handed it to him. And he says, this day has this scripture been fulfilled in your hearing. And that just because they knew he was talking about the Messiah, the Mashiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King, and they tried to stone him. After he said that, they tried to stone him. Oh, hallelujah, ha, hallelujah, Lord God. So he said this in a synagogue in Nazareth, his own hometown. They weren't happy to hear that, amen? But what the funny thing is, is that he stopped at what we would call today a comma. It wasn't the end of the scripture in Isaiah. And in Isaiah 61, verse 2, it says, and the day of vengeance of our God. See, he went through all these things that he's here to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. How many times have we sought God and he has, he has healed our broken heart? He has, he has delivered us when we were captives. He, to recover sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised. All these things Jesus said, and then he says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and then he stopped. Well, but the Messiah, the Messiah continued on to the day of vengeance of our God. Why didn't Jesus continue on? Because it wasn't time yet. Amen? It was not time yet. And so we find that Jesus was trying to let them know, look, you have a lot of growing up to do. You have a lot of changes that need to happen. You have to open up your hearts and receive in the Gentiles because I didn't just come for the Jews, Jesus said, for God so loved the world... Oh, hallelujah, he so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him, whosoever, not just the Jews, but everybody believes on him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so in verse Isaiah 66, 15, it says, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots like the whirlwind will render his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. See, the last time God came with a flood, this time the Bible says his rebuke will come with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword, oh, how many people know that the sword of the Lord Hallelujah is his tongue. Amen. Oh, hallelujah today. The word of God is the sword of the Lord. The word of God is his tongue. What he speaks comes out. It is a double-edged sword. Hallelujah. It will cut the enemy, but it will also cut the children if we are disobedient. We need to repent. We need to seek after his face. And it says, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render in his anger, to render his anger in fury. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in the receiving end when Jesus renders his anger in fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. Verse 16, for by fire the Lord will enter into judgment, and by his sword and with all flesh, those slain by the Lord shall be many. And by his sword with all flesh, and those slain by the Lord shall be many. Oh, hallelujah today. And see, the thing is, the, the terrible thing that 
that we don't preach often enough is that when you die in your sins, you don't cease to exist. There are so many that would like to, to tell you that you cease to exist. There are many that tell you, well, God will send you to purgatory for a while, and after you have been purged, that's not what it says. That's not even close to what Scripture has to say about all this. So it says here in verse 17, Isaiah 66, 17, those who sanctify and purify themselves go into the groves. Now see, this is a mock. This is not talking about people who are actually sanctifying themselves and purifying themselves and living holy. This is talking about people who sanctify themselves and purify themselves according to the word. And then they go into the groves that, and they follow after those who are eating pig's flesh and dipping it in whatever abominable thing, ground up, nasty insects, things that they're, they're dipping this flesh into. And they're eating mice and other things that are just corrupt. And it says, they shall come to an end together, saith the Lord. So here they're sanctifying themselves. They're calling themselves holy. They're trying to call themselves holy. And then they're turning around. They're going up into the mountain, up into the groves. And then they're dipping into the pollution, the perversions, and the disgustedness of the world. And God is saying, not so, you cannot come to me and act holy and then turn around and surrender yourself to the world as well. Oh, hallelujah today. And it says that these shall come to an end together, declares the Lord. And it says in verse 24, we're skipping from 17 to 24. And they shall go out and look upon the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. So these are people who have rebelled against God. They have decided we know, ha, oh, maybe we love God. Maybe we don't love God, but we're going to do it our way. And he says, they shall go out and look upon the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me. And it says, for their worm shall not die. Hear what it says? Their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Their worms and their fire shall not be quenched ever. Not ever. Oh, hallelujah today. Oh, there's going to come a time when you're, ha, hallelujah. There might come a time, I should say, because this, this is after the time when God has raised the dead up and they have stood before him in their glorified bodies. And you might be in a glorified body, but you will be in a glorified body in hell. Or you will be in a glorified body in heaven. The choice is ours at this point in our life. But if you make the wrong choice, if you decide... I, I love God. I really love God. I love going to church and worshiping and praising and seeking his face. But then I'm going to go to the groves afterwards. I'm going to dip the polluted thing into more polluted things. And I'm going to partake of that. Why? Because I don't believe that God cares how I live my life. Well, guess what? God cares how you live your life. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall come a time of trouble such has never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is found in the book. Is your name written in the book? So that's a question you've got to ask yourself. Everyone's name is written in the book, a book. Might not be the Lamb's book of life, but everyone's name is written in a book. 
And if they find yourself written in the book, hallelujah, of the damnation and curses of God, well, then that is the answer for your eternity. If they find yourself in the Lamb's book of life, if that you have accepted Jesus as your Savior, then that, hallelujah, today, that will be your answer. And it says here that everyone shall be delivered whose name is found in the book. And they're talking about the Lamb's book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life. Okay, that sounds good. That sounds like what I want. I want to awaken into everlasting life. But it says some to everlasting life, and some, you're still going to awaken. You died. Things were on pause for a moment. Now you're going to awaken again to everlast, to shame and everlasting contempt. That means that you are going to experience shame and everlasting contempt forever. It's everlasting. It's forever. Daniel 12 and 3 says, And those who are wise, are you wise today? Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever, and those who turn many to righteousness. Are you a soul winner? Proverbs 11, 30, 11 and 30 says, He who wins souls is wise. Oh, hala koroshed daraka. So if you are wise, if you are wise, if you are wise, you will be winning souls. If you are not wise, you will be as one of those in everlasting contempt. Daniel 12 and 4, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now you think about life in Daniel's time, people riding around in chariots, horses, mules. Think about in Daniel's time, building their houses out of giant stone blocks and, and living with no running water. Think about Daniel's time, and then think about now. You know, we got electric lights. We have, if you're hot, you turn on your air conditioner. We have all these things that we have learned. We have so much knowledge, so many new things that we have discovered. And it says here that, hallelujah, if we are wise, we will shine as the brightness of the sky, star, sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That means that they're going to shine like the stars above because they have one souls. But then he says, shut up the book, Daniel. Shut up the book. Many are going to run back and forth and knowledge, not wisdom, not wisdom. Knowledge shall increase. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white. The reason it says white is because when they baked a clay brick, they knew that it was finished. They knew that it was ready to be used when it turned white in the oven. So you will be white and refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. What a surprise. The wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. So God told Daniel, seal it up, seal up the book, close up the book. Don't allow the book to continue. Seal it up. And he says, and the wicked are going to behave wickedly and the wise are going to behave wisely as is their nature because either you have Christ within and you have the nature of God or you have no Christ within and you have the nature of your father, the devil. So it says here, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Understand what? They shall understand what the Spirit of God is speaking to them. 
Because if you are not saved, you cannot hear the Spirit of God in your heart. Matthew 8, 6, 18, 16, excuse me, Matthew 18, 16 says, Whoever causes one of my little ones to believe in, who believe in me, if you cause one of his little ones who believe in him to sin. So in other words, you lead one of his little ones astray, it would be better for you to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. I think about, there's a singing group. I can't remember if it's Labarge or Eldbarge or whatever, whatever the, you know who I'm talking, if you know the singing group, you know who I'm talking about. All the children got into drugs and alcohol, all of them. Not one of them. They were all raised in the church. Their mother brought them in the church, but at some time or other, Somebody either in the family or somebody outside the family introduced them to drugs and alcohol. Now you might think, well, but they just, just it was just a taste. There are some people that have such an affinity for drugs and alcohol that just a taste is enough. You get just a taste and you can't quit anymore. You, you just can't quit. I don't know who it was that led that family down that path. I know the father drank all the time. I know the father had some issues. Maybe it was him. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was somebody else. But whoever it was that led that family, that family that was filled with wisdom, filled with the ability to sing, the ability, they, they could sing the songs of God with such clarity, with such beauty. But then the devil twisted it. Whoever led them astray, the Bible says here, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, whoever caused that little one who believes in him to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone tied around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now you think about this for a moment. Whoever it was that led that family astray, most of them are dead. So it's, you know, it doesn't really matter anymore, right? No, it does matter. Why? Because we are eternal beings. You are either alive to God or dead to God, but you're still an eternal being. And so it says, Oh, hallelujah today. In Matthew 18 and 7, woe to the world for temptation to sin. It is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom they come. See, God wanted you to recognize you need him. He wanted you to recognize you need to listen to him. He wanted you to recognize all these things. And sometimes we forget we are human beings and we are flawed. We make mistakes sometimes. But I promise you, whoever it was that talked that family into taking that first taste of alcohol, that first taste of a drug, whoever it was that did that, and that, that weakness that was within their flesh that just took them over, whoever it was that did that, there is a special place in hell for that person. Unless they repent and ask God to forgive them for their sins, there is a special place in hell for that person. Oh, hallelujah today. And it says, Woe to the world for temptation to sin, if, for it is necessary. We don't always understand that. We don't understand the fact that God believes in the test. He believes that he will tell us what is right and wrong and expect us to do our best to serve him. And if we fail in that, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. We can come to Jesus, we can repent, we can ask him to forgive us for our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and he will do so. 
but it is not necessarily going to taste that, take that taste out of your mouth. Take that taste for alcohol and drugs out of your life. It's not necessarily going to take that taste out that you didn't have before, and now you do, and now it's a burden on you. It is better never to have done certain things that lead you and you feel bondage, you feel burdened, that you just need it, you need it, you need it. And it's a lie of the flesh. But you need to ask God to forgive you. Oh, hallelujah, today. Matthew 18 and 8 says, And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to enter into life crippled or lame than to have two hands and two feet and to be thrown in eternal fire. See, we have a hard time thinking of that. In our world today, we, we would rather just think, well, you know what, I'll just repent. God will forgive me. I'll just repent. I've, I've heard different pastors say that. Well, what if I did do that? I'll just repent. Well, first of all, if you did do that and you have this laissez-faire attitude toward it that you can just say, it. Oh, what if I did? Well, then you have a problem right there because that meant that you did it willingly. You did it on purpose. You knew it was wrong. Now, I... Love to be able to say I've never committed a sin with premeditation. But that would be a lie. Huh. <laughs> that would be a lie. All of us have committed sin with premeditation. All of us have committed sin where we didn't really think about it. I'm going to tell you something. If you, com if you just slipped and committed a sin and you ask God to forgive you and repent, the road to redemption in that particular circumstance is a much shorter road than if you have deliberately committed a sin on purpose and then said, oh Lord, please forgive me. Because I promise you, if you have committed a sin on purpose, there will be a long testing period where God will continue to try you to make sure that that thing that gave you weakness in that area has been burnt out of your life. Now, I don't know about you. I don't like being tested and tried by God because I have failed. I don't care particularly for the trying and the testing process when I am successful. It is not pleasant. But it is much less pleasant when you have failed him on purpose. Oh, hallelujah today. So it says here in verse 8, if your hand or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled or lame. Now we can't, we have a hard time getting that. But I think if you stop and think about it, Matthew 18 and 9 says, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. You know, there's a lot of men out there and not, not few women who are just looking at the opposite sex going, ooh, ooh, ooh. And sometimes opening your big mouth and uttering something stupid. And if you were blind, I can't say you wouldn't sin if you were blind because that would be ridiculous. I can think of some blind performers that found way to sin quite successful. And we're quite successful at sinning. Oh, hallelujah today. But if you're not looking at ways to sin, if you're not touching ways to sin, if you're not speaking ways to sin, it is easier to avoid sin. Hallelujah today. If what causes you to sin because God has declared it a sin is your preferred lifestyle then you need to lose that thing. You need to cut it off. If your what causes you to sin is something that you don't find particularly oppressive to you and it doesn't really seem to hurt anything, but God has said it's a sin, then it's a sin. Whether you want to accept that or not, 
If you ask God to help you, he will help you and he will help you to change. Hallelujah. So that your mind is renewed by the word of God. People say, well, I think that's just the way I think. It's the way I feel. It's the way I am. It is who God made me. Let me tell you a secret. You, newborn baby, coming out of your mother's womb, that's how God made you. You, polluted by lust and sin and, and poisoned by drugs and alcohol, that is not how God made you. Those were choices that you made in life or choices that were foisted upon you by somebody else abusing you. And the truth is that God said that your mind can be renewed by what? Your mind can be renewed by the word of God. Study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Oh, hallelujah today. Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Well, what's He sitting on now? He's sitting on His Father's glorious throne. He's not sitting on His glorious throne. So when He comes with all his angels with him, he will sit on his throne. His throne is the throne of David that God promised to King David that it would always be in the tribe of Judah. Well, it hasn't always been in the tribe of Judah and there has to be a healing of that circumstance. And the only way for there to be a healing of that circumstance is if the Messiah, the Mashiach Nagi, the Messiah, sits on the throne of David. So right now he's sitting on his father's throne. When he returns in his glory, he will sit on David's throne. Now, Matthew 25, 32. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So here is God he is separating the people one from another. He's putting the sheep, hallelujah, he's putting the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And it says here, now you might say, well, what's a goat? Well, a sheep is someone who obeys the word of God, who comes when he calls. The Bible says that my sheep know my voice and another they will not listen to. So you got to ask yourself a question. Are you listening to another? Huh? Are you listening to another? The goats, have you ever been in a, the goats are always ramming into something. You park a car in the middle of a goat pen. You come back a couple weeks later, that car is beat half to death because they're just ramming it with their horns. They're just ramming it. And it says here, and the king shall say to those on my right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit he, the king, the king, the king of kings and lord of lords is saying, come you who are blessed by my father. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. But he says, my father will bless you. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do you know that there is a kingdom prepared for you? from the foundation of the entire world. And it says in verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. Now you need to pay attention to this verse because this is telling you something here. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You stop and think about that for a minute. The people were just nonplussed. They were like, well, we, we don't recall doing that. But in verse 40, he says, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, 
to the saints that are around you as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers. You did it to me. Do you give money to the poor? Do you help them when they're in need? Huh? Do you, do you help the widows and orphans? Do, do you do that? Do you, do you treat the nation of Israel with respect and with courtesy and, and try to be a blessing to it? If you do that, according to this, you have done all these things to Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then in verse 41, and he looked to those on his left and said, Depart from me, ye cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me any drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. The other day, I was stopped at a light. Light changed to green, and the car ahead of me just sat there, and it just sat there, and it just sat there, and it just sat there. And I figured they were looking at their phone or something. I just tooted on the horn just to let them know. I wasn't blaring it or anything. Just let them know, hey, light's changed. And they... Went around the corner about like this. And it was a 40 mile an hour road and they went all the way, almost to the end of that road at 25 miles an hour. I didn't say anything. I just kept back. They went past my turn. I turned off and went on my way. But one day, that person is going to have to explain why they chose to act that way towards somebody that was simply trying to let them know, hey, the light's changed. Now, I've had people honk at me because I've been off in my thoughts and the light changed, I didn't quite catch it. And I just went on my way. When we decide we are going to act in a passive-aggressive manner towards somebody just because they told us something we might not have wanted to hear, something in our life we might not wanted to hear, well, guess what? You are going to be as one of these people. And you need to understand this, that when you see somebody in need and it is within your purview to help them, you need to help them. You need to be proactive about it. You need to stop and think about it. You need to say, you know what? I need to carry $20, $30 in my wallet so that when I see somebody in need, I can give it to them and receive my blessing. He says, I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then, you know, they're, they're asking him, but, but uh, wait a minute, we, don't, we didn't see you. We didn't, well, he's not going to come in his own person about that. He's going to send somebody with that need to you. And you need to be attentive. You need to be using the anointing of the Spirit of God to awaken you to a need. I was driving the other day and, and I'm in my own little world, but driving along and I stopped at a light and almost like I got a nudge in my heart, almost like I got a nudge in my heart. Hey, over here. And I looked over and there was a guy who needed money and, and he was saying, please help. And so I reached in because I keep a little bit in the center console of my car so I can bring it out and give it to somebody at need. And I tooted the horn. I said, hey, and he turned around, and he came over there, and he goes, God bless you, sir. God bless you. And he went on his way. You need to be proactive about what God has for you to do. You don't brag about it. You don't tell everybody and their mother about it. And some people are going, well, see, you didn't get your blessing. Well, if I lose a blessing on that one, just so that you can have an understanding of what I'm talking about, then let me lose the blessing on that one. 
Oh, hallelujah today. In a verse 45, Matthew 25, 45, then he will answer saying, truly I say to you, as you did it not to the least of one of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away, and I want you to hear this, into eternal punishment. But the righteous, the ones on the other side, on the right side, the righteous into eternal life. Just so you don't you get the, don't get the idea that maybe eternal punishment meant purgatory. Eternal punishment is anios kolesis. Anios kolesis. It means eternal. You know eternal's forever, right? Eternal eternity forever. Eternal torment. Torment. Mark 9 and 42. Hallelujah. It's the same as the other one. It says, whoever causes one of the least of these who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were tied around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. You stop and think for a moment. Every movie you've ever heard which mocks or causes the Christian character to stumble and considers this to be a good thing. Think about those. There was a movie a while back, never watched it, but I have read, I did read the, the, whatever it is, it tells you what it's about, but what is it, Fifty Shades of Grey. And from what I understand, there was a Christian character, a young woman, and there was a wealthy man that decided he was going to seduce her. In real life, that man that chose to seduce her is going to be one of these that will wind up in eternal punishment because he has caused one of Jesus' little ones to stumble. You think about the people who, hallelujah, sell, you know, who, who sex trafficking and things like that going on in America even, going on around the world. Those people are causing the little ones to stumble. And God is going to judge them, each and every one. <clears throat> now you, you think about this. You think, well, I'm not so sure. I, I, I still think that God, if he's a loving God, let me tell you something. God says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God expects more because he offers us more. He offers us the opportunity to repent, to be forgiven, to be cleansed. He gives us that for free. And if you choose not to receive Jesus, to receive the gift, hallelujah, glory to God, to receive the gift that he has offered you, then you are going to receive the punishment and you're not going to want the punishment. I promise you that. The last section of scriptures here, it's called Flee Youthful Lusts. 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Stop sinning. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. Which are you? Do you want to wind up in eternity in hell because you decided to be a toilet of life? Or do you want to make it into heaven because you decided to be a beautiful vase that, that led people to Jesus? Therefore, anyone who cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honor, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Think about that. You were dishonorable. You came to the Lord. You repented of your sins. You asked his forgiveness. 
and you became a vessel of honor. Verse 2 Timothy 2 and 22, So flee your youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call upon the Lord with a pure heart. Do not remain a dishonorable vessel. Amen? I'm going to stop here today and I will finish up this lesson next Sunday. But I want to encourage you to understand the fact God sent His Son to forgive you for your sins. You have the right to ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You have every right to be set free from the bondage of sin that has been over your life for so long. But you have to make that choice. Ha! Huh? There are some things that you will not understand, you cannot understand until you ask Jesus to come into your heart. I pray today, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, anyone who hears this message, anyone, Lord God, that hears this, do not let them through ignorance, foolishness, do not let them, Lord God, experience an eternity in hell, but rather draw them to your name. Your name is life and hope and joy and grace and truth. Let them speak and say and call upon the name Jesus and be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and that which a mighty, mighty burning fire. We thank you for that today. And we give you the glory and all of the praise today, Lord God, in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you, beloved. I really do hope that if there are some of you who are on the fence, that you will come over to Jesus' side. Oh, hallelujah, today. Ask his forgiveness and to cleanse you and to open up your eyes so that you might see. I love you. I appreciate you. What I say unto one... I say unto all, watch and pray until we meet again. God bless you, beloved.